And when looking at his miracles, looking at his life, looking at his qualities, looking at his perfection, all you have to do is to believe in him. I read once in the Newsweek that there was a poll conducted by the Newsweek, and they discovered that 78% of Americans believe in miracles. Well, all you have to do is to believe in his miracles. Prayers and blessings be upon him. Prophet Muhammad's miracles are over 3,000 miracles documented, authenticated. We're not talking about 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 miracles. Few miracles, handful miracles narrated from Prophet Jesus. Although we believe in the Prophet Jesus, peace and prayers be upon him. And he is the best of all messengers after Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet of Islam because he was the one who handed down the message to Prophet Muhammad peace be and prayers be upon him yet we're speaking here about thousands and thousands of miracles that were witnessed by people eyewitnesses and narrated not only by individuals but by groups this is why we have to learn more about this man and I think rightly did actually Michael Hart by selecting the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, you would be surprised. And this is a non-Muslim writer who picked up the most influential 100 personalities of the world and around the world. And he decided after a lot of studies, surveys, research, that Prophet Muhammad is the most influential human being on the face of the earth. So it was number one in his book, 100 Personalities. Well, uh, we actually have a caller on the phone with a question. Uh, sister, are you there? Yeah. Uh, what Hi. was your question? Uh, my question was, um, so if God created Muhammad perfectly beautiful, um, aesthetically beautiful, and he, then he expects, us to, he expects us to love Muhammad because of his beauty, then does, he, does God also expect us to despise people without beauty, like without aesthetic beautiness? in their uh, facial features or whatever. Well, here is the other aspect of beauty, which I was going to talk about, because uh -huh. beauty of, of various, is of various aspects. First of all, of course, the appearance and the form. And it is one of the most helpful elements in any messenger that God create him beautiful, handsome. And if people, and there are many people on the face of the earth, who would be attached only to the outward form of beauty? Right. And I may call this the outward form of beauty. So it's not wrong that God created a messenger or all messengers on a certain level of beauty. And Prophet Muhammad had actually the highest level of beauty. But of course, when we look at Islam and uh, the theory of beauty in Islam, we see that Islam actually looked at beauty from the other aspect. Mm -hmm. The other oh, okay. aspect, it is the inner beauty. The beauty of the soul, the beauty of the inside, which is manifested by the behavior, by the character, by the intellectual ability of a human being. This is why the, prof the Prophet of Islam spoke, if I may interrupt you, sister, the Prophet of Islam spoke of people, for example, being closer to God, even if they didn't have any aspect of the outward form of beauty. Oh, okay. The Prophet talked about a man who is untidy and uh, is uh, black and without any probably aspect or trace of beauty being actually the closest to God. And he opens his hand and God accepts his dua or his supplications. So it's not about uh, the outward form of beauty, but there is, there is a large percentage of human beings that is attached only to the outward form and for that reason and we address uh. these people well if this is what you're attached to then look here is a reason for you to love prophet muhammad but of course we expect our listeners especially the muslim ones and many other of intellectual amongst non-muslims to be attached to the other aspect of the beauty of prophet muhammad this is why i spoke about his perfection in terms of his behavior oh i see okay so there's no, um, there's no hierarchy in the, the kinds of beauty that will give, bring you closer to God. It's, it's oh, no, 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 more beautiful, more closer to God. No, there's nothing like that at all in Islam. Actually, the opposite could be applied uh, because the beauty is in the behavior. Uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, a famous uh, scholar amongst the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala, may Allah be satisfied with him, says, Man kathurat salatuhu bil-layl ashraqa wajhuhu bin nahar If you want your face to be more shiny during the day, then pray more during the night. So the source of oh. beauty is closeness to God. So you pray more during the night, then your face uh, is more shiny during the day. 
Okay. I hope that uh, answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks for calling. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Mecca one 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 one. Ya Nabi salam alayka Ya Rasul salam alayka Ya Habib salam alayka Salawatullah alayka Ya Nabi salam Mecca one 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 one. Muhammad, you were talking about uh, how Prophet Sallallahu his example was a perfect example. When I read about his life, his seerah, it's stressed that he brought the middle way. If you could explain to us, to our listeners, what that meant. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, God Almighty, described the nation of Islam. And when I say here the nation of Islam, I don't mean a race, I don't mean a language, I don't mean here any group, the Muslim community I mean here, because you have in America here a group called the Nation of Islam. So, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And thus we have made you a community of the middle way, or a nation of moderation. Umma means a community or a nation, or that is built not on a race or on a color or on a language, but built on the covenant to God, coming together to believe in God. This is what makes a community in Islam. This is why you find people in Islam talking to each other from Indonesia to Morocco, brother, brother, brother. So, a nation of moderation, a community following the middle way. The middle way in terms of theology. That is to say, we're not fatalists and we don't totally believe in free will. We believe that God gave human beings a certain will, but also God creates our actions. We don't believe that, for example, sins never harm. And we don't believe also that a sin may also drop you in the hellfire forever. We believe that people may commit sins and then they have a chance to repent to God. So the way of Islam and specifically represented in mainstream Islam, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people who are following the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, namely the followers of the four madhabs here, the Hanbalite school, the Malikite school, the Shafi'ite school, and the Hanafite school of law. I mean here, those represent the middle way in terms of theology. And we have several other aspects. When we come to speak about uh, Islamic law, we see also Islam representing in terms of Sharia, the middle way. If you looked at uh, the instructions or injunctions God revealed on nations or peoples before Islam, you would see that they were made very tough. Let's say if, you, if your cloth was made filthy by some stains of filth on it, and you wanted to clean it, the instructions before Islam were you had to cut it, you had to get rid of the filthy piece. There was no way to purify it. In Islam, God made it very easy for us. You can just wash it in water and then you get it clean. If you missed your prayers, you had to go back to a specific place, to the mosque, to pray in the mosque. You couldn't pray anywhere. While God made it for Muslims and anyone who follows this path, very easy, you pray anywhere in the world, as long as it is clean. We have several aspects of this middle way. And especially here we're talking about the title of the message of Prophet Muhammad and the title of Islamic Sharia. People think when we speak about Sharia that we're coming with a burden of corpus of law to just tell humanity, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. No, actually, what we have to do and we're, what we are allowed to do in Islam is actually 90% of what we do and what we are, let's say, prohibited from doing is just a very marginal percentage what we are allowed to do is so many and the sharia is titled as uh, being merciful and prophet muhammad's main description peace be upon him is merciful and mercy to humanity god wanted us to know him with that title which actually shapes islam islam being the religion of Mercy and Prophet Muhammad and his message is being a message of mercy and a man of mercy. We have not sent you but as a mercy to the worlds, God says in the Quran. Not only to human beings, but also to angels, also to 
matter also to animals to plants if you just saw his instructions on how to treat animals you would see how much mercy he brought to animals if you just saw his instructions and went through his instructions how to protect plants and trees you would see how much he was merciful and how much mercy he brought to plants and the green this is why the sharia altogether comes to establish that middle way for humanity which brings mercy to humanity